When I was a kid, specifically when I was in the second grade of my elementary school, I remember there being an all-out war between the kids. Now you may be asking, what kind of warfare was it? Well, it was the most brutal of them all, the one that spans across the entire internet for all eternity. Which franchise is better? And this time the two war camps were Harry Potter and Pokemon. Little did we know, these two would become the two most profitable franchises in the world. Also, I was on the winning side. I talked about the Harry Potter universe on my streams before. Despite this world becoming a worldwide phenomenon, I never got hooked by it. And I got to a point where literally 20 years ago, I watched the first four movies as they came out as a kid, then I lost interest and then about four or five years after the last ones came out, I went and binged watched everything. Now, because I watched the movies for context, I hardly remember anything. I only know the very basics of this world, nothing else. I have never read the books, which I know contain a lot more information about this universe, and I never went into any of the amusement parks or anything like that. I'm your perfect definition of someone who casually consumed the world of Harry Potter because... why not? Of course, I have also always been aware of all the people who love this universe. Again, the Harry Potter universe is one of the most profitable in the world. And that's because its reach is endless. It doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter if you are a kid, a parent or a middle-aged man wasting his time during a crisis. Apparently, this universe has ways to hook you. And yet, that hasn't happened to me. Which is why I'm here right now. With Hogwarts Legacy only just releasing, I realize this might be a new opportunity for me to explore this universe with new context. And since it is using the media which I love, that being video games, the good kind, the chances are, for me, that's gonna be the easiest way to dive in. So, let's start from the beginning, with the source material. Just remember that I will probably mention some spoilers from the base series, but I will avoid all spoilers from the game. The world of Harry Potter was always a bit strange to me. From the way the spells work here, to the way the world feels isolated, to how simple most of the characters are. I always thought that I was weird for thinking that this alleged masterpiece of a world had... plot holes. But all it took for me was to have a bit of research around the internet to find out... Yeah, Harry Potter has a lot of plot holes. As it tends to be when you introduce unlimited magic, powerful items set up in the early books which never came back, and time traveling. But what's even more fascinating, I didn't know that... This was simply accepted to be the case. Even the biggest Harry Potter fans will admit this story has massive plot holes. But nobody really minds because you won't notice these as a kid. And this is something I did not expect to find. I mean, it does make sense. Primarily, the book series was aimed at kids. That's why spells can just work. Because a kid reading a book won't pay it too much mind. I mean, at the intended age at which you are supposed to be reading this book, Kids usually don't know how half of the things in the world work. As a kid, Alohomora probably makes more sense to you than magnets. And this kinda seeps into all parts of this series. Characters can be simple. They don't need grey morality. They don't need characters with their own shifting motivations. A character can simply be either good or evil and for the sake of the story of Harry Potter it is going to work because it is primarily a story about good versus evil. Another thing that really bothered me is how tiny the world feels in this series. It all focuses on the main character and when the scope tries to get bigger, it was only focused on Hogwarts, the wizardy places around it or London. It was as if those were the only parts in the story that mattered. Yes, I remember that there were some mentions of the other schools and the other countries where you can also find wizards. I believe in the Goblet of Phoenix there were students from other schools, and after that the story immediately went back to Hogwarts only. I also remember Norwegian dragons being mentioned, but that was really it from the outside world. 
and that was always so weird to me. There was an all-out war with the Lord of All Evil, and all we got was Hogwarts students fighting alongside with some of the important teachers. Now don't get me wrong, my favorite scene in the entire series is where the stone statues get summoned at the end. But still, where is the rest of the world? Are you telling me the entire America doesn't have a single wizard? Did the rest of Europe not care about the final battle? Also, they have spells to teleport around, but they deliver mail by owls? Sure, let's say you can't teleport objects around on their own. Wouldn't a teleporting mailman be a thousand times faster? And lastly, the big issue I always had is... How does magic work? Of course, if you know a little bit of basic writing, you'd know there are two ways to build a world. There is the hard world building and soft world building. One gives you precise rules on how things work, and the other one keeps things more mysterious as it is focusing on the main story. Harry Potter is absolutely the soft world building kind. Because yet again, it is meant to be read by children. But in this case, the entire world is so soft if you try to build anything out of it, it melts like ice cream. Apparently, spells are invented by wizards. But we never learn how that can happen. Do they wave their wands around and saying random words until something happens? This kinda hints that spells work on a formulaic basis. So is there science behind magic? Can you harness it like electricity? Also, what are the boundaries? There are spells to unlock any lock in the world regardless of what kind of a lock it is. You can turn anyone into any object. There are objects that can just infinitely spawn other objects, but somehow resurrecting people? No, there is no way to give someone their pools back. Also, everyone is using wands, but sometimes some wizards don't have to use them. You also have to shout words, but sometimes you can be quiet. Which, by the way, inventing a spell, yeah, let's say there is some science behind it. But figuring out the word on top of that, how does that work? To me, all of this felt like a big bag of inconsistencies. But that's most likely because I never experienced this series as it was meant to be experienced. I am aware that most of these questions probably get answered in the books, because the books hold a lot more information than the movies. Which could be why my interest in this universe was never able to get a grip. After looking at the current Harry Potter universe, a really big portion of it seems to be held together by nostalgia, which is something people got to build 20 years ago. This unfortunately means that if someone wants to step into this franchise now, they are locked out of it unless they decide to binge watch all the movies or unless they decide to read all the books. Or at least, that's how it worked until now. Hogwarts Legacy is the first time ever this franchise decided to change its approach towards its audience. Instead of focusing on the media that can be enjoyed by anyone at any age, this is the first time this franchise separated the video game segment and they released a new piece of Harry Potter media specifically for this community. Of course, in the past we did get a bunch of Harry Potter video games, but all of those were just recreations of the movies. They were targeting the people who already loved them. And they did not serve as a way to introduce new people into the story. They might have tried, but we all know it didn't work out. So Hogwarts decided to change that. And on top of the books and movies, they added in a new way to engage with this universe. And oh boy, did it work. So now, let's talk about the game, from the gameplay to the lore. Again, I will only show you scenes from very early in the game. So don't worry, there won't be any massive spoilers. It all begins with the launch itself. There was a bit of scuffness there. First of all, more expensive early access is a bit questionable on its own, especially when locked behind premium additions to milk impatience. But honestly, that's not that bad. And this is by far the worst thing you can expect this game to pull off. There are no microtransactions or anything like that here. The other questionable thing was midnight release based on your time zone, instead of the classic global release. So the eastern time zones would get it before the west. 
This resulted in a hilarious mass migration of people. Everyone became citizens of New Zealand. But after that the game finally rolled out. And from the moment you open this game, you learn exactly what you're getting into. It is a perfect presentation of what you are about to encounter. Yeah, if you're like me and you have a mid-range computer that is slowly aging, you probably spent a lot of time here. This is when you probably realized you should have gotten it on a console. Then, after your shaders finally compile, you are hit with this. This is a screen that should immediately hit you with confidence in the developers. Accessibility has been a question in video games for a very long time. That's why the Game Awards now have a category for innovations in accessibility. Normally you have a little enhancement for people with hearing impairment. Maybe some options for colorblindness. Or options for subtitle sizes. This, however, is on another level. It is obvious the devs knew this game is aiming at the broader audience. So they really made sure this game can be played by anyone. There is text-to-speech, motion sickness fixing, text scaling, high contrast gameplay, motor enhancing for aiming and camera control, cognitive help control to remind you what objectives you are dealing with, swapping left to right handed play, and even help with playing one handed. If this game is not nominated for accessibility features by the end of the year, I'll be very surprised. And contrary to what you may believe, this is absolutely not a standard. And it really shows you how much the devs care about this game. And after this we get into the character creation. It's your classic character creator with pre-made faces and hairstyles. Nothing amazing, but it is not bad by any means. The fact that you can choose whatever body type with whatever voice and whatever pronouns really adds onto the fact that the devs tried to make this game as inclusive as possible. Yet again, massive props for that. But there is something really awful happening here that needs to be called out. It is so incredibly bad, I can't believe people are not boycotting this game over this. The pitch slider. What they did is that they got two voice actors to voice the main character, one for male and one for a female voice. If they only stuck with these two options, everyone would be fine with it. But they tried to go the extra step and they fell face first into a pile of dung. You see, on top of choosing your voice, you also have the option to change the pitch of the voice. Which means make it sound higher or lower. And they did this through in-game filters. TLDR on sound theory, every sound vibrates. The faster it vibrates, the higher the tone. If you want your audio to sound lower, you stretch out the audio. But if you stretch it out, it will also sound slower, like a drunk guy at a bar at 3am watching European streamers. So now you have to speed it up again. But to do it, you have to do it artificially without raising the pitch. So now you made a monstrosity, so to hide it, you are gonna layer it on top of the original audio. And that's why in Hogwarts Legacy, if you lower the pitch, you're gonna sound like C3PO. I'm eager to get to Hogsmeade. But besides that, the character creation is good, so let's move on. We'll spend most of this video talking about the world and the setting and how this game tackles it. So before that, let's quickly get through pure gameplay. This is an RPG, so seeing the classics like crafting items, collecting materials, collecting gears with stats, even though the stats mostly don't really matter, and also applying transmog is all really cool. All of this absolutely fits in with the general audience. But then... Why? Why is this game, which is trying to hit the broadest possible audience, hit you with a combat system more complex than The Witcher, faster than Devil May Cry, and more reaction dependent than Dark Souls? The first time you get into combat in this game, outside of tutorial, even as a veteran player, you're gonna die. At least on normal difficulty. And it will take you a while till you adapt. And that's because this game simply has a lot of buttons to press. And the control scheme is different from all the games you are used to. 
Having a separate button for parry and dodge is fine. It works in the Soul series and it works in Sekiro. But neither of these have to focus on four spells, each of which is countering differently colored shields, keep track of their cooldowns, keep track of which attack you can and can't block, keep track of the throwable items around you, you have a separate button for potions, you also have separate consumable items, and you keep track of your ultimate ability. I'm not saying the combat is bad, the fact that you can build your spells however you want is really awesome. And once you get into the flow, it feels like you are weaving spells. But man, is it way harder for casual players than intended. What also doesn't help is that while in the other games you also have a simple block button. Here, it simply doesn't exist. In other games, if you feel pressured, you can simply raise your shield and assess the situation. Here, no. If there are four enemies, you bet things are gonna get hectic. Although, I have to say, I think I figured out why the gameplay is so chaotic. It's because the keyboard layout sucks. No, really, you know what's the default keybind for swapping targets? Arrow keys. The goddamn arrow keys. The keys on the other side of time and space from where you are actually playing the game. For the other actions, you have space for jumping, shift for sprinting, control for dodging, Q for parry, Y to throw, X for ultimate. It's a cluster of mess around your pinky and ring fingers. It's using a control scheme unlike any other game. In Elden Ring, for example, the dodge and sprint buttons are the same. If you hold it, you sprint, if you press it, you dodge. What would I give to have this option in this game? But here, that's not the case, because this game was designed for controllers first. And this is the point I'm trying to head into. People, play this game with controllers. Somehow, it is so much easier. But this finally leaves us at the most important part. The story. Okay, previously I lied, I will show the first two minutes of the story just to drive a point. It's only gonna be the intro, so yes, I will spoil the first two minutes of a 50 hour game. Hopefully we'll be fine. Just like how the game sets your expectations with the initial screens, so does the story set your expectations for what this game is. It takes them eight frames to remind you, you're not a kid anymore. Yeah, I didn't expect the story of this game to get so dark and serious so quickly. Later, you even get to use spells that literally just murder people. And it all makes sense why. Those who read the original books are now 20 years older. So they absolutely have the freedom to go quite a bit more mature. However, that doesn't mean the game design doesn't make you feel like a kid anymore. The first time you hop into this game, you actually get the letter. Ask any old school fan of Harry Potter and they all tell you. As kids, they all dreamed about one day getting this letter and being invited into Hogwarts. I had no idea this was universal thing, but apparently all kids wished for this. And so it is cool that this game pays a tribute to it. Right after this, we got to the house choosing part. Another fantasy a lot of kids dreamed about. And here it is done through a personality test. Like a, a really watered down personality test. Normally these tests have like 10 very specific questions, but here you only get two. And I am still convinced only the second one really matters. Then again, it only suggests which house you should join, but it's ultimately up to you to choose. And that's where you learn the choice is mostly cosmetic. It is true that each location has a different entrance at different parts of Hogwarts. And each house has three different friendly NPCs, all of which give you one or two side quests. Outside of that, the choice really doesn't matter. And it only slightly alters some voice lines when some NPCs recognize what house you're from. Besides that, I don't believe it seriously affects the story. Speaking of which, let's dive deeper into the story itself. The world of this game has two big components. The big and spoilery component is the main story. So let's quickly get this one out of the way first. But again, don't worry, no spoilers. Simply said, even though I haven't finished the story yet, I'm about 70% through. The main story of Hogwarts Legacy is quite good. And that's because it is written like a movie. Which is a big contrast compared to the last universe I visited. 
you can set the combat difficulty to story, bypass all the chaos and still enjoy the game. It has its own storyline, completely different from any of the books. It has its own characters with their own little twists and their own little motivations. It is true that all the characters are a bit more complex because the audience is older now. But overall, the way the story is written is on point. It really feels like yet another Harry Potter movie. Because for the most part, it is a good old tale of evil versus good. And partially, it also feels like the old movies because of how the voice acting is handled. I don't know if it's just me, but I always felt like acting in the movies was... Okay. It's definitely because it was all just a bunch of kids. And you had to stick with the same kids throughout the entire series. It didn't matter if they did or didn't have a talent for acting. You just had to roll with them. And to me, it felt like a lot of times the characters didn't have emotions. Or at least it never felt like there was a massive range there. I mean, maybe it's because they didn't want to traumatize all the kids. But unfortunately, Hogwarts is doing the same thing. Everyone kinda just... talks. When something bad happens, they say, Oh, shoot! And when something amazing happens, they say, Well, that's nice. Is that... Is that simply because that's what the British are like? So to reiterate, the voice acting is good. Although not very emotional. But on the good side, that's always how it's been in the movies, so it doesn't feel out of place. And speaking of... Speaking, we should mention that not all the dialogue options are actually illusions of choice. I would say about 80% of all the dialogue is meaningless, but about 20% of the times it actually does something. In most cases, it alters the views of some characters on you. This usually happens when you make someone mad. And in very rare cases, it also alters how some quests play out. So just keep in mind that while in most cases the dialogue options are pointless, sometimes they alter the course of the world. Which is where we should talk about the world itself. As I mentioned, this story has two components, with the second component being heavily driven by the lore. And that one is immersion. And this is where this game truly shines. If you are a Harry Potter fan and you ignore the combat, you ignore the gameplay, you ignore the story. You will still love this game. Because I have never seen this much attention to detail when it comes to building a world. Most importantly, you will love the fact that you can go anywhere at any time. And the world is completely open. It really feels like you are exploring a near-perfect replica of Hogwarts and its surroundings. It has absolutely everything. Inside the castle, you can find literally every room from the movies. Down to individual classrooms, including the Leviosa classroom, the Defense Against Dark Arts classroom, and even the Botanicas. But outside, things get even better. Of course, there is the Quidditch Court. You can also visit the iconic village of Hogsmeade. You can visit the train station, the Forbidden Forest, the little glass house for the boats where certain characters die, and even the observatory where other characters died. But there is also the iconic bridge, the courtyard where the final battle happened. This game simply has it all. But what's most impressive about this? The devs didn't flip too many assets. Besides the walls and the generic assets like stacks of books, every classroom has objects lying around related only to that classroom. If you walk into the room where you learn how to cast combat spells, you will see posters on the walls. But those posters will be different from those anywhere else. Because they are related to what you learn in that room. Normally, games heavily reuse assets to fill the rooms with environmental detail. But this game went way too far beyond that. And they made an insane amount of unique individual models to fill all the rooms so that everything could stand out. And this is only really a tiny thing that helps with the immersion. Another massive part is that all the characters are always present somewhere around the school. Unlike how it functions in the majority of RPG games. All characters in Hogwarts are always persistent. And in fact, some of them even behave differently based on who they are. No spoilers here, but one time I saw this strange guy just walking around with a wand. 
But later in the story I learned who he was and what he was doing. The point is, all characters are always somewhere around the school. Even when they are not important to you right now. This is honestly so cool to see. If there is a scene where you attend a class, after the class is dismissed, the NPCs don't just vanish. They stand up and they walk out into the school. If it's night, you will see that all the halls are empty because everyone is in their beds. But if it's middle of the day, you'll see that the halls are full of students. This also means that if you want to continue on the main quest and the NPC is not there, your character kind of just like sits down and waits for them. And then when they arrive, you kind of like stand up and act as if you were not in their office the entire time. Yeah, it can feel a bit awkward at times. But overall, it really makes this world feel alive. Which is helped by the fact that everything everywhere is magical after all. Stone statues will move and react to you. Random objects will start talking to you. If you hear music, that music actually comes from instruments or paintings around you. The trees come alive. There are ghosts randomly flying around. And by far my favorite is that one gargoyle who is constantly ranting about the fact that there is a thousand different staircases and he ended up at the bottom. All of this makes this world feel even more alive on top of all the students who are constantly walking around. Another puzzle piece that fits onto this is transmog. You can make your character look like anything you want. You are not restricted by how your gear actually looks. Instead, you can fully immerse your own character here. And the devs knew most people would love doing this. Which is why they gave this game its own cosmetic progression. By progressing through the quests and looking for collectibles, you can unlock new clothing that is purely there to help with immersion. These pieces have no combat stats. But this also extends to crafting your own wand, which a lot of people are gonna enjoy. And you also choose what animal or broom you wanna fly on. If you combine this with the fact that you are running around and casting non-combat spells, like repairing bridges and lighting up torches, you quickly get to feel like a part of this world. With another awesome part being that if you are tracking a quest, you are running around with a book like a student would in a school. Beyond this, you also have the option to look around for the hidden lore of this world. A lot of it is done through collectibles, finding secrets or important locations. Every interesting place gives you some lore, which can range from really interesting things to filler lore. But it all helps with making this world feel rich. Besides this, you also have a journal with all the enemies you encounter, although here it only gives you tips on how to defeat them. As far as I know, you won't find any lore here. And when it comes to items, such as gear, in most cases you do get one or two lines, but it's nothing massive. It's really nothing compared to what you can find in something like Elden Ring or even Genshin. But it still feels really amazing when you find reference to something you might remember from the books. However, Hogwarts pushes this even further beyond this. Remember when I mentioned that the Harry Potter universe has a lot of holes, but nobody really minds because nobody cared when they were kids? Yeah, this game knows about it. And in many cases, if you snoop around, you might find answers to the previously questionable things. For example, you get to meet a student who comes from Uganda. And you may ask her how does magic work there. And that's where you learn in Uganda, wizards don't use wands. They cast spells with their hands, but the magic is just as powerful. Using a wand is simply a different kind of wielding magic. But this piece of info also gives you greater scale for this world. There are other magic schools around the world, and they behave very differently. In another part, there is a wizard who questions the naming of the spells. He mentions that most of them are Latin or Greek, which naturally made me wonder, what did the wizards do in the ancient Greek times? There had to be wizards there too, right? This sort of exploring this universe beyond just the source material does wonders for this game. And it delves into a universe the base Harry Potter books never could. And yet again, it makes this universe feel alive. Now, this entire time, I kept rambling about how amazing the immersion of this world is. In fact, I do believe this is one of the strongest parts of this game which gets multiplied tenfold if you are already a fan of this universe. 
And that's without me mentioning that you can even take care of animals here or engage in player housing. But this game also does have a lot of issues that break everything. Some of it is just core game issues. But if you are playing on PC specifically, the chances are you are gonna see some horrifying things. First of all, let's talk about the core issues this game has everywhere. Specifically, animations. I saw some people mention that this game can easily dive into Uncanny Volley. But I never paid it too much mind because Hogwarts Legacy is using the classic conversations driven by animations, which were popularized by Bioware. Animations in this game have two states. During the important cinematics, everything is properly acted out. But while we are outside of the cinematics, all characters have about seven different animations for their torso and legs, and about four different head movements. So when you are talking to characters, all they do is combine these different animations, which is meant to roughly mimic their emotions. Which is why, at times, the characters may also feel robotic. Especially if that's something you are not used to seeing. This animation system is not really that bad. Good games can utilize it well enough so that you won't notice it. But in the past, there have been some games that were not really good at it. And here, it's okay. On top of this, their facial animations are purely driven by audio. By which I mean they feed the audio into the game, and the software tries to figure out what the lip movement should look like based on the sound wave. This is pretty old, but still reliable tech. However, the issues start when you are not playing at maximum settings, especially on PC. All of these animations need to be calculated. So what happens when your computer is at its limits? The game drops a few of these calculations. The funniest glitch with this is connected to the eyes. The reason why sometimes you can see that the footage looks uncanny is because the game just forgot to calculate the position of your eyes. On their default state, both eyes are directly staring ahead of the character. Which is something your eyes never do, they are always focused on something at an angle. That's unless you are asleep. But you know, the eyes aren't the only jank here. Sometimes the game makes you look at an object and then forgets to make you look away. So you walk around with a snapped neck until you restart the game. Also, if you meet an NPC that is not currently part of any story, they come to a full stop, they say something and Walk away. Oh, I'm not much for dueling. I prefer to keep things friendly. Which can get very awkward. Also, as cool as running around with a book during trekking is, the map itself looks awesome, but it has no sense of verticality. So trying to figure out what waypoints are where in Hogwarts can be really hard. This might be a tiny thing, but another strange one are the spell introductions. You always play this minigame, which is an obvious reference to one of the first Harry Potter games. But since the wand movement never feels crucial to casting a spell, that's including the source material by the way, because in the movies they just do whatever with their wands and it always works. It really feels like a minigame. You do it once, it's not even challenging and you never see it again. Which does feel strange. But by far the biggest flaw this game has is something you won't feel on the beefier machines. And that's how the loading screens work. If you want to make a seamless world without any loading screens, you need to be clever about your world design. You need to make it so that there is always a wall that blocks off the next area so that you never see everything at the same time. This makes it so that the game never has to load everything at the same time. In short, basically, if you don't see it, it is as if it doesn't exist. So, during the main story, every now and then when you trigger a big cutscene, in order to make the game feel seamless, while the cutscene is playing, in the background the game will start loading in the next piece of the world. Unfortunately, if your computer is not up to par, this can create experience that is anything but seamless. Yeah, streaming with 5 FPS is fun. The last thing I quickly wanted to tackle is the music. 
I think everyone knows that John Williams is a legend. If you grew up in the 90s and even the early 2000s, you will probably know this name. Or at least the chances are if you watched a movie with catchy music, be it Star Wars, Harry Potter, Indiana Jones or E.T., the chances are it was written by John Williams. The reason why his music is so iconic is because it always went against the modern standards. The motto of the modern formula is, the best movie music is the one you can't notice. Of course it's referencing that the music is supposed to be so good it perfectly blends into the movie. To which I say... Bullshit. It was proven time and time again that the movies with catchy music tend to perform better. Everyone knows the Imperial March. I dare you to hum a single melody from the Avengers. When it comes to Hogwarts, they tried to honor the legacy of Williams. And for the most part it works. They use the same instruments, they stick to the same emotions, but it is entirely new music. The only time you hear the classic Harry Potter theme is when you get a new collectible. Unfortunately though, at times the music tends to drop back into the boring formula. But at least in this case, it's only because every game needs some ambience. So at least the exception here works. So the music is good, it is a nice tribute, but personally, I don't feel like they managed to deliver a new memorable theme. And this brings us to the conclusion. After trying to delve into the universe of Harry Potter, I was confused. I didn't really get it, I saw a whole bunch of problems, and I pretty much learned I was too late. All the hooks this universe has only really work when you are a kid. So then I tried to give this universe a second shot with Hogwarts. Overall, I found this game to be really good. I'll bite nothing special when it comes to the core gameplay because it behaves like really any other open world RPG. The fact that about 40% of the entire game are tutorials is a bit of a double-edged sword. You are constantly unlocking something new. Which makes you wonder when are you gonna be finally let free so you can explore the world. But at the same time, because you are constantly learning something new, it makes you feel like a student in this school. And as I mentioned, it is the immersion that was really nailed in this game. So after I experienced both versions of this universe and I took a step back, I got a chance to get a better perspective. Especially after finding a very crucial piece of information. Hogwarts Legacy may be happening in the past, before any of the core story happened. But more importantly, the devs confirmed that this game is not part of the canon story from the source materials. And this changes everything. Because with the entire context of Hogwarts Legacy, and with all the awful stuff that's been happening in the background the entire time, this is when perhaps the biggest revelation hit me. This game has nothing to do with Harry Potter. Besides the world setting and a few familiar names, this is a whole separate piece. It doesn't rely on the fame of Harry Potter to forge its own path. I don't know if you noticed it, but Harry Potter isn't even in the title. That's how confident the team was about their own game. It's not Harry Potter, the legacy of Hogwarts, it is simply Hogwarts Legacy. A new game forged for a new audience. And it just happened to be placed in a familiar setting. And this is something a lot of people overlook, and they shouldn't. Because while you're making a video game, it is difficult to make it fit into an already existing media. That's why a lot of video game adaptations fail. But making a game from a movie, while trying to completely separate it from its source, is a completely different beast. And in this case, it succeeded. They fully separated themselves from the source, which goes way further than people may believe. It seems like the devs knew about the concerns of the community, and they knew about it for years. Which is why over the years, the devs made some really good steps to make this game great. For example, they directly approached the trans communities and they worked with them directly to build this game. Which goes against the fundamental ideas of the maniac who is holding this IP. That's something people don't talk about even though they absolutely should. In cases where game devs go against the owner of the IP, they either just quit the game or they silently work on it. It seems like these devs just decided to rebel. 
But then there was the really awful time when people found out that the previous game director had a YouTube channel where he posted some really questionable videos about anti-feminism. But as a result, two years ago, that person was removed. Which, as shitty as it sounds, is way more than other companies have done in the past. And of course, all of this leads to a single point. Drama caused by the fact that Rowling is quite an awful and hateful person who is directly hurting people. This entire thing is one massive grey area, because if you do some browsing, you may find literally every kind of opinion on this. People who are for or against this game. Trans people who are for and against this game. People who don't want their money to go to Rowling. People who want to support the devs for making an extremely inclusive game. And that's why this topic is so complicated. I have seen every argument used on both sides. But there is one issue that you simply can't ignore. Yes, with 10%, if the game sells 10 million units, which is where it seems like the game is gonna end up, Rowling will get 6 million dollars from this. As a side note, this is her daily income. Which is why she never gave a damn about this game. But if, for whatever reason, you feel guilt, there is something you can do against it. If you donate the price of this game to Pro Trans Life, you will offset the money of 10 people who bought this game. So if you got something nibbling on your mind, that is always an option. So, with all of that said, after experiencing the game and taking it all in, as someone who has never cared about this universe, did I get a spark of new interest in Harry Potter? No. I genuinely do not feel like a fan more than I did before. I am simply not a Harry Potter fan. But I am interested in what Hogwarts Legacy is gonna do in the future. It is a new take on a universe that is trying to build itself up completely separate from what came before. I really do not care about the story of the books or the movies. But this? This is awesome. After opening the universe so much, I would be interested in what the wizards look like in other countries around the world. What if we actually get a game of wizards from the ancient Rome? I feel like the devs opened up a Pandora's box where they can really do whatever they want. Will they do it? Probably not. But they can. And that's my take on Hogwarts Legacy. A pretty good game with an interesting main story, but also an amazing immersion. And also a lot of grey area around it. And from this, if there is something I have taken to heart myself, it is that I will never tweet about this game again. 